Okay. Good afternoon and welcome to Vermont House Judiciary Committee. It is Tuesday, April uh, 13th. We are now going to turn to S3. Thank you, Eric, for that. Um, yeah, sure. Okay. Just one thing to add just to for, for committee's uh, interest. Uh, also, the Senate Judiciary Committee this morning it looks like they're going to concur in uh, H. Uh, I think I have the. I was about to say H one ninety nine. I don't think that's what it is. Maybe it was one ninety nine. The the uh, the bill regarding uh, powers of attorney and their use during emergencies and conveyances that uh, you folks passed out several weeks ago. Right. Right. Great. Right. I don't. I don't think there's any changes to that. So I think they're uh, talked about that quite a bit with them this morning and it looks like they're going to move ahead with it as as past the house oh great thank you yeah that, that's yep. that's an important bill great okay sure. thank you yep so okay great so now we're going to switch to s3 relating to competency to stand trial and insanity as a defense and as you may remember we're slowly getting through all our witnesses. <laughs> um, and so Christina Robinson of the network is here to, to join us and share her testimony with us. So good afternoon, welcome. Good afternoon. Sorry, I had a little, little Zoom issue there. Uh, thank you so much for having me. For the record, Sarah Robinson, Deputy Director at the Vermont Network Against Domestic and Sexual Violence. Thank you so much for the continued testimony that you've been taking on S3. And I'm here today, I'll be fairly brief, just to weigh in on the importance of the victim notification sections and talk a little bit about that. Um, so largely, you know, we do believe that there's an important role for victim notification where there has been criminal justice involvement and someone is committed to the care and custody of the Commissioner of Mental Health. Um, and in these cases, the bill that you've been considering does seek to address some significant gaps between the criminal legal system, the mental health system, and victims of crime that have existed for, for some time. So I'm going to uh, speak to section three of the bill, notice to victims, um, and speaking to subsections A and B of that section. Uh, and just to say that first, the uh, is the importance of victims having some level of notification when there's a change in treatment setting, uh, especially a discharge. And in our small communities here in Vermont, it's important that victims have this information through trusted channels prior to discharge. And this allows people to consider what might be needed for their own safety, um, all kinds of safety, and most importantly, not to be surprised to find out that the person who caused them harm has had a change in their freedom of movement or location. And there have been a few instances where um, victims have reported um, hearing from other community members or even seeing individuals that have caused them harm and have had no notice um, that that was a possibility. So we're, we're supportive of that. Um, second is this, uh, it seems like a small issue, but I think it is significant to victims, and that is the issue of absconding. Um, and we work to add this language in in the Senate. And I just wanted to um, lift up and reference a letter that has been posted to your committee webpage several weeks ago from Deborah Brookfield. Um, and in the case of this victim, a person left their treatment setting. And the only way that the victim found out is because their advocate happened to see a missing person's poster um, on the evening news. And Ms. Brookfield is not the only individual who has experienced this. And we feel like this is an important change in procedure. And we would be fine with changing the language of abscons to elope, um, which was a suggestion that was made by Jack McCullough from Vermont Legal Aid. Um, and I think the reference he gave was 18 VSA 7101. Um, and that changed would be fine with us. Um, and in regards to subsection C in section three, which I know the committee has had a lot of discussion about, um, we very much hear and are sensitive to the concerns raised um, by both disability rights and mad freedom. And I would just like to note two things here. 
first, uh, information on treatment status is often fluid and constantly changing. And second, after such a notification, um, frankly, there, there's really no recourse for victims in those cases. So while this information could potentially be helpful, it could also be unhelpful and contribute to a sense of danger for victims that's not reflective of an actual level of risk. Um, so we're glad to know that stakeholders are considering what can be done to the language of that section, either striking the language or putting this in the realm of the forensic working group to address those concerns um, regarding orders of non-hospitalization. And we're certainly happy to assist in those efforts to the extent that our input could be useful. Um, so we're grateful for your work on this bill and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sarah. Um, not seeing any hands, but I'll just give folks a moment. Uh, Tom. Thank you. How are you doing, Sarah? Um, I, don't, I don't know if this is a question for you or not. It might be for, is Eric still here? Yep, I'm still here. Yep, there he is. <laughs> um, is there any HIPAA um, uh, issues as far as letting victims know when you know when some, when when there's treatment involved? I mean that that's healthcare. I can well, I can just say I think that um, my understanding is that there has been some concerns about that section C. Um, and around the intersection that those types of notifications around treatment status might have um, as it relates to HIPAA and other privacy concerns. And so that's the section that I was noting. Um, we very much hear those concerns and uh, would are glad that there are stakeholders looking at that or that that section is going to have a closer look. But I'll defer to Eric on the rest. Um, well, I would say that I have heard those concerns as well. Uh, I don't share them in terms of the, the HIPAA concern. I, I think you've probably, the committee's probably heard that I don't necessarily have the same legal analysis of the HIPAA issue as, uh, as either Dale, I'm sorry, or DMH or, um, some of the other advocates you've heard from. So, I think there's a, a legal basis for, for the information to be disclosed for the victims to get it. And uh, um, not to say that it wouldn't be litigated, it probably would be, but I think that the same exception to HIPAA that applies to the two sections that you're keeping in, at least at least of which there has been less, less controversy about moving out, this, that same HIPAA exception, the mandated by law exception, I think applies just as much to uh, the ONH provision as it does apply to the previous provision, the two other provisions about requiring um, uh, the department to let state's attorneys and the attorney general know when somebody's treatment status has changed. So then again, that, that's not the policy question. That's for you guys to think about. That doesn't mean it's the policy you want. You can choose whatever policy you prefer. But I, my view, and I think our, our office's view, is that you have solid solid ground on which to rest your decision if you decide you want the, the information to be disclosed. There's a, a basis for, for reaching that conclusion. And the, the only single case that I found that, that talks about this uh, sides in favor of disclosing. And um, so that's my conclusion. So so with, with uh, again, with the HIPAA stuff, Eric, if, if somebody... I don't know if the right term is voluntarily voluntarily leaves treatment, I guess, or 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 leaves their treatment ahead of time. Um, it, would that not be so much a HIPAA um, concern as a as a change in treatment would be? Um, I don't, to me, if, if somebody is gonna you know is gonna bail on their treatment, I guess to me that that they've uh they've you know i mean it's just me knowing what i know uh they've given up their hipaa rights from there it, it would seem but maybe not i i'm not sure what kind of an impact that would have on the hipaa issue i think the 
the sort of basis for for the disclosure of information uh, that would otherwise be protected health information, PHI, under HIPAA, is that the disclosure is required by law. So I don't, I'm not sure that it matters whether the person leaves voluntarily or not. If their if their right. health information qualifies as protected health information, then it can't be disclosed unless it meets one of the exceptions under HIPAA. And as it right. happens, the exception that we're viewing as permitting it in this case is the fact that the disclosure is required by law. Right. And my my thought was more around you know letting letting victims know, especially if somebody did um, prematurely leave treatment. So. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, sure. <clears throat> Go ahead, Kate. Thanks. Um, hi, Sarah. I don't know if you came prepared to talk about this section, but I was just curious since you're here. One of the areas in the bill talks about a uh, forensic work group. And I don't know if you've taken a peek at that at all. Um, and it does. It looks like the language creates some some space in terms of ultimately deciding who comprises that group. But it does list out a number of people or entities that would be included. And I guess I'm just curious if you had any thoughts or reaction, or if the network did in response to the the makeup of that group or the charge while we're at it. Um, sure. So we were definitely supportive of uh, the inclusion of the two victims of crime appointed by the Vermont Center for Crime Victim Services. I think that's going to be a really important perspective to have on the on the work group. Um, and otherwise, um, I don't necessarily have any other other comment on the work group itself. Other than uh, cool, just to note that it's and obviously an, an extremely complex system of care and that it makes good sense to have a working group looking at the broader issues related to this population. Thanks. Okay. We do have written testimony from Chris, from Chris Benno about um, putting in some language regarding victims in, in the charge of the working group, um, which we'll refer to when we start doing markup. So that might answer your question as well, Kate. Um, okay, seeing any other hands, Any anything else, Sarah, before we let you go? Oh, that's it, thank you very much. Okay, great, thank you. Okay, so let's see, we have a, our break is scheduled, I believe, at 2.30. Just to make sure I got that right. Yeah. So what, what I would like to do um, before our break, and since we, we have Eric, is to go through S3. And I'm going to identify places that um, where I've heard consensus um, in terms of our testimony, as well as places that um, there may not be consensus. Um, and have folks let me know if I've missed anything. Um, but this would be the, you know, to, to start to put together a, um, a committee amendment. Um, I will say that Representative Van Donahue um, has put something, um, something similar to this in, a, um, in an amendment. Um, not, it's not, um, it's, it's from, it'd be, you know, it's her thoughts not representing the committee on on, uh, on healthcare, um, and I know others on the committee are, are, are thinking about it too. So if we could just take a few minutes to do this, and Eric, I know you have an ongoing list as, as well, and I'm gonna just go page by page really. Um, so in terms of on the first page where it talks about copies of the report, who they're being sent to, um, I know there was, um, Testimony adding Dale, um, you know, Representative Donahue mentioned that. Um, also adding the respondent, we heard that from uh, from Wilda White. Um, I um, reached out to um, uh, AJ Rubin and um, Jack McCullough about whether or not to add the respondent, and they were okay with that because um, right now the law is 
it's silent on whether or not um, what happens when the respondent is not represented by by counsel by an attorney whether or not the respondent gets a um, gets the report so so I would suggest again just for for starters um, to add to add respondent to that section on who gets the copy of the report um, okay am I forgetting anybody in there anybody Nope. Okay, great. Um, the next page, um, the new language um, in two talks about about the two different opinions and, and the timing of them and that um, that needs, I, I think we only had one witness, the uh, medical society that thought that that language was was clear. So I know um, Eric is going to be working on on that. We also heard from um, Department of Mental Health that um, I believe um, Wyoming has had some language um, regarding that, and that also that could be um, something put into the um, to the forensic working group. So, any other thoughts or comments on on that? Does that sound consistent with what we've heard, Martin? So uh, I've also uh, talked to Eric about trying to put in some language uh, that addresses the issue of uh, spoilation of evidence or preserving evidence uh, and, and who would be responsible for that. So uh, there will be a, a proposal uh, just for us to look at that I've asked Eric to, to work on. Okay, great, great, thank you. Um, okay, and then let's see the... Um, the next, the, uh, on page three in B, um, this is um, having counsel, um, having Vermont Legal Aid represent, um, provide counsel. And I think we heard, testimony we heard was um, pretty much unanimous in, in support of that. Uh, Martin? Yeah, I, I did have a question on that, on that language, that as far as whether it can be clarified a little further even. The, the fact is that it, it cites to sub, subdivision A2 of the section, and then it describes subdivision A3 and A4. Shouldn't it just say, you know, stand trial pursuant to subdivisions A2 to A4 of the section? It's just a drafting question, uh, Eric. It's not, you know, changing the, the meaning of it. Do, does that make sense, what I'm asking? That it just... One of the things that just spell, says, look at A2, and the other two, it actually has the language of A3 and A4. Yeah. Do you see what I mean, Eric? Uh, I just, do, yeah. There's not yeah. a consistency among those three. Right. So yeah, it might make sense to strike the cross-reference specifically since you don't have it in the other two places. Yeah, well, yeah, then, right, right. Just like, spell out what A2 is if you're going to spell out or, or have them all say A2, A3, and A4, whatever. Just not parallel, that's all. Right. Great. Sounds good, I have that one. Thank you. Um, okay, and then the next area is on page six. Madam, Madam Chair? Yeah. Um, why, um, why is the uh, word entitled to have counsel appointed? Why is the, why are, is the state or taxpayers paying for that? Why isn't, why is that written like that? You know, like, it's a simple question, I guess. Well, they have they have a, a constitutional right to counsel already because they're going to be confined against potentially against their will. The only distinction is that this is shifting the person who represents them from the Defender General's office to Vermont Legal Aid uh, because of an expertise issue, because uh, they're not criminal proceedings anymore. Um, and the reason that uses the word entitled is because it previously, actually last year even, it had said 
shall be represented by Vermont Legal Aid, but they wanted to preserve the person's ability to have their own private attorney if they wanted to. So they could have their private attorney pay for it themselves or um, have Vermont Legal Aid do the representation, um, which they, they have a right to have state counsel if they want to because of the nature of the proceeding. But it's not saying they can have their own lawyer, does it? No, but that, that's, the, that's the reason the, the word entitled is used. They're entitled to have counsel, but they don't have to. But would, it, would an average person, uh, such as I'm questioning it right now, would, would they even begin to know they could have their own lawyer if it's not stated? Wouldn't it be you can, ha you can have your own representation or you're entitled? I think that's a question for you, you know, the, how you read it. I read it as a, a permissive thing, but um, that's up to you folks. Yeah, thank you. And, and Eric, actually that history of, of that it had been shallow and now it's entitled is, is helpful. And we, I'm looking at my notes, we did hear from Judge Grierson that, um, that the judiciary does support this and, and um, because as Eric said, it, um, legal aid really does have that expertise um, in these cases. Um, so. so, so, so you think somebody that that is involved in this would automatically go through legal aid? They wouldn't have their own lawyer. I'm really confused here. Yeah, most people do, from what I understand. Most people have legal aid do the representation. They don't have. Private counsel do it. <laughs> well, that's interesting. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Great. Um, okay, thank you. And then, um, so then we come to page six and there's that section C that we've heard a lot of testimony on. Um, you know, originally um, there were some folks that wanted in there and then, um, but the attorney general's office and others realize that there are problems. And so there is, has been consensus to take that section out and um, make that part of the charge of the forensic working group. Maxine, can you just say which section you, just so I'm- Sure, it's, um, it's C, so I'm looking at yeah. page okay. six, yeah, yeah. I just wasn't sure, because there's also the, absconding language issue, right? In Did I miss the eloping, changing that? Um, I think it's at the top of page six, unless there's a different instance. Okay, yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I, I'm working off of, I have actually two copies of the bill. One is past the Senate and one, uh, yeah, thank you. That's right. So in Right, and three, change abscons to elopes. So Maxine, backing up, there's two other things that... Uh, okay, great. So back on uh, subsection B that we we're just talking about, uh, adding, and this is something that, uh, that Ann Donahue flagged for us, adding and if applicable, the Department of Disabilities, Aging and Independent Living. I know that Eric already has that language. Uh, okay. since we're adding them up front. And there's a second place to add uh, Dale, and that is in subsection uh, 2A on page five, I believe it is. Since, since we're adding them as far as they, they, they are being added in this. Right, okay, great, thank you. Did, uh, I think I was going to throw just toss out there on that. And I, is the presumption then that you want to add all the Dale references from Representative Donahue's proposal? Yeah, yeah. So is is have they been involved? I'm just making sure that someone from Dale has signed off on that. Or let me double check. If you check. want to, yeah. Let me double check. Okay, and I'll double check with Representative Donahue as well. Um, okay. okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. 
Um, the next change that I, um, we're gonna need some committee discussion about is on page seven where we have um, Jay, which is the attorney general has, um, they have one position and the uh, defender general's office has, um, has another one. And so I, I wanna bookmark that um, as some place where we'll need, you know, some definitely some committee discussion on because there has not been consensus on this from our from witness testimony. Martin, yeah. Yeah, I'm sorry. I, I need to back up one more time. Yeah, this is another uh, suggestion that came out during testimony from uh, Ann Donahue uh, on page uh, six in uh, subsection uh, Roman numeral two. The, after the victim of the offense, uh, she has suggested adding for which the person has been charged. Um, that's a suggestion from her. I, I particularly, I don't think that's needed because this is talking about the victim of the offense. It's not talking about the victim of the offender, but you know, I, I don't think it's actually necessary, but if it makes it clearer for people, I just wanted to flag that as something that uh, Ann Donahue had brought up. Okay, all right, thank you. Um, yeah, why don't we, Eric, if you can note that and then we can think more about that. Okay. You did. Um, okay, and then, so section five, um, I know that um, House uh, Corrections Institution as well as um, House Healthcare will be looking at, at this um, assessment piece and um, but we did hear about time frames. Um, that was pretty consistent that that November 1st time frame is really not workable. So I think we heard six months a year, I'd say probably a year. We can just put that in there and for starters and then discuss it. Um, and then the forensic care working group that is also being considered by um, the healthcare committee as well as um, institutions. We, we did hear concerns um, that is the charge is too prescriptive. Again, the time frame. I think there's consensus on the time frame. Um, that out for a year, maybe the in terms of who was on it. Um, we heard from Wilda White, um, person with lived experience plus person with experience in the um, in the issue. Go, ahead. go, 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 Not right now. And let's see. Um, also under um, one on page nine, that's where um, Chris Venna talked about putting language after um, adjudicate not guilty by reason of insanity, putting language something like impossible expansion of victims' rights. Um, and I know there's concern that, that this language may seem like it's assuming that we actually do need a forensic facility as opposed to determining if we do. So um, possibly some rewording of, of that um, we might, might consider. Um, I know the Medical Society would like a member, or rep, you know, representation on here. So certainly talking and also um, mentions of um, competency restoration programs, looking at those. Um, and then, like I said, the the time. So so we can we can talk about those and we can share those with um, with healthcare. Um, as they come to their recommendations. But certainly that's clearly, those two sections are, are clearly sections that um, are, are in other committee jurisdictions as well. Um, Barbara. So I thought that there was restoration of sanity as well as competency and have, making sure, I mean, I realize it's not in our section, but just that, um, that philosophy and the the services that are lacking to restore people's either insanity or ability to stand trial. I guess it's sort of the same, but, and it seemed like a few people 
called out in the prescriptive sense that why are we mentioning Connecticut? And so perhaps it's saying, looking at other states, but not directing people to Connecticut. Right, right, thank you, yeah. So that's, that's a good point, yes, thank you. Uh, Kate. <clears throat> yeah, um, I guess just to make a distinction in terms of Barbara, but you were just saying, just because of the bill that we're talking about, like when they're talking about sanity in the context of the bill, we're talking about it in terms of assessing mental health state at the point of the actual act. So you wouldn't be, re you wouldn't restore sanity in, in terms of like sanity defense. I just want to name that since these things get like confusing. Um, I don't know. I mean, are you at, at this moment in time, are we just sort of like flagging areas? Like there were a couple of things that, okay, I wanted to name, but I think maybe we'll be circling back around to all those areas so we can, I can save it for another time. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, Bob. Yeah, just a quick question. Uh, I've got a couple different one of these going, so I'm not sure which one we're on to follow here. But I know Chris Fennell, if I'm pronouncing that right, also brought up a question about notification for, has that been addressed in, in the amendments? So her, um, yeah, she, her written testimony proposed putting language, I believe on page nine, um, which I mentioned, so I'll go back and double check, but, but yes. Thank you. Yeah. Did Chris have an earlier suggestion though, that we're, that we decided? That she replaced, she, she um, she rethought that earlier suggestion and then um, replaced that suggestion and testimony with um, with written testimony, subsequent written testimony. Yeah. And Bob, I think you had other questions or feedback. No. Oh, thank you. Oh, okay, great. And Barbara, I'm going to assume your hand is up from before. Great. Okay. All right. Well, great. Well, this is good. It just will give us something to to look at and 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 work from as we move forward and and as we wait to hear from the other committees. So, and um, Eric, I'll touch base with you about about Dale and and reaching out to them. So, yeah. Okay. When you say just about you say something to work from, right? So, do you want me to sort of integrate some of these comments now for purposes of? You know, having it in hand, or do you want to wait for a, a future markup date, or what's your what are your thoughts? Um, I think it'd be good to take what Representative Donahue and add, and then add these as a um, into an amendment to to look at. Yeah, the only the only part that I didn't follow was you you went through the working care group things more quickly than I could jot them down. I couldn't really tell whether. Right they were just thoughts for discussion or whether some of them were like amend the working group itself. So other than that, I, I think I got a handle on everything, but. Um, yeah, I think the working group, it, it may actually be more of a list right now until we um, see what healthcare is, you know, what healthcare and corrections are doing and just sort of a, a list of the points to, to be in contact with them. Sure, okay, that sounds good. Yeah. Okay. Okay, great. So thank you. Thank you, Eric. Thank you, everybody. So let's take yep. a 15 minute break and then we do have some witnesses.